other important officers brought together to discuss different strategic and technical questions before decisions were reached. His support for such a collective approach, and his ability to get his own way within it, also pointed the way to another reason for his bureaucratic success during his career. The tensions between Leahy and Stanley simmered throughout 1934, before eventually boiling over. The CNO, in the end, decided to try to drive Leahy out of the fleet. The key issue was Leahy's next sea command, scheduled to start in the middle of 1935. If he did not receive a major assignment, it would mark the end of his career, with retirement following soon after. Perhaps, Stanley thought, with his direct line to the President and Swanson, he would prevail. If so, he was badly mistaken. Leahy was far more politically connected and astute than Stanley, and crushed the efforts of the CNO. What Stanley did not seem to understand was the wide base of support Leahy had established in the Navy Department, Congress, and the White House. Leahy's friendship with Roosevelt, for instance, was reasserting itself. Between 1921 and 1933, it seems that the two men had not met in person. On December 6, 1933, Leahy and Louise were invited to attend a speech by Roosevelt at the National Council of Churches. Not Leahy's natural milieu, it was a meeting of pacifistically inclined Protestants, and Roosevelt gave a subpar speech. However, what most surprised Leahy were the heavy leg braces that the president was wearing. He admitted that it was the first time he had seen Roosevelt up close, since FDR had contracted polio, and he'd had no idea that the president's disease had left him so completely crippled. As chief of the Bureau of Navigation, Leahy started attending White House conferences, presidential speeches, and even football games and other sporting events with Roosevelt. It became clear that the two men had a much closer relationship than would normally have existed between a president and the fourth-ranking member of the Navy Department. In late December 1934, for instance, Leahy went to the White House for a conference about military education. He was one of the most junior people in the room, which included the Secretary of War, Henry Roosevelt, and General Douglas MacArthur, Chief of Staff of the Army. Regardless, Leahy was the one who afterward chatted informally and swapped jokes with the president. Stanley, who seemed unaware of Leahy's standing, made his move in early 1935. Leahy was angling to take over as the commander of the fleet's battle force that summer. Most of the U.S. fleet in the mid-1930s was divided up into forces. A smaller, lighter scouting force, made up primarily of destroyers and some cruisers, whose job it was to discover the enemy, and the heavy fist, the battle force. This latter force included all the battleships and most of the best aircraft carriers, destroyers, and cruisers in the fleet. Its job was to annihilate the enemy in a pitched battle. Though placed below the Sinkus, the commander of the battle force was the premier combat command position in the fleet. Had the U.S. Navy gone to war, the commander of the battle force would have called the shots in any great sea battle. Leahy was desperate to get the post, and Stanley was just as desperate to deny him it. Stanley lobbied hard to keep Leahy from becoming battle force commander, but in doing so, he ran into a brick wall composed of Swanson and Franklin Roosevelt. The president had always taken a keen interest in senior naval appointments and had made sure that the secretary of the Navy continued to call the shots over the CNO. Even though Stanley tried to persuade them otherwise, Swanson and Roosevelt supported Leahy's promotion. Leahy, who watched all of this unfold, understood the power of his political backing. And in one of the most illuminating and cocky entries in his diary, made it clear that he was confident that the Secretary of the Navy...